In this video, I'm going to be walking you through the entire process of upgrading the soldered storage on this M1 Apple MacBook Air. Now, if we go ahead and take a look at the specs here, you can see that this appears to just be a normal uh, M1 MacBook Air uh, base model, of course, with 8 gigs of RAM. Um, but in fact, this model is actually a little bit weird in that instead of having what I assumed was the base configuration of 256 gigs of soldered storage, this machine, as you can see here, only has 128 gigs of storage installed. Now, I thought this was pretty weird at first. I didn't even realize this machine existed. Uh, but what I found out is that this configuration is what's called the education model. And I guess it was only offered to schools or something. Uh, but it also has a special NAND configuration of only 128 gigs of internal storage, which is basically nothing in today's uh, computing world. Um, but in addition to only having 128 gigs of storage, this machine also only has one NAND installed onto the board, where of course it has provisions for two NANDs. So what we're going to be doing in this video is I'm going to be upgrading the onboard storage from its original single NAND configuration and installing two one terabyte NANDs, which look like this. Um, so this guide will encompass all of the M1 machines that are not the M1 Pro and M1 Max and M1 Ultra, but it will also potentially cover any of the M2 machines and potentially the M3 machines, although some of the M2 machines and I believe all of the M3 machines uh, use different NANDs uh, than these BGA 110 style NANDs I have here. Uh, but in theory the same process, albeit with different chips, should apply. And when I say only normal M1 machines and normal M2 machines and not the M1 Max Ultra or Pro, um, I mean that in because these machines only have provisions for two NANDs, uh, making the maximum that you can install uh, two terabytes because the largest NANDs they make for these are indeed one terabyte each. So in this guide, I am going to show you any all of the nuances and all of the processes needed to upgrade um, one of these M1 or M2 machines that only has two NANDs on the board. So with that, the first thing I'm going to do is get this machine uh, shut down and opened up and I'll get the logic board removed and I'll show you exactly what we're going to be working with here um, in the case of this one with only one single NAND installed. All right, so as you can see here, I've got the board out of the chassis and uh, immediately you can kind of see that it looks like someone has worked on this board in the past and kind of messed up all these capacitors right here. I mean, they're all on the same rail, so it really doesn't matter that they're like that, uh, but it is still <laughs> kind of funny nonetheless. Uh, this board was sent into me, or this machine was sent into me by somebody to perform this upgrade on, uh, so it's not mine, but... Um, I'll probably clean those up, uh, you know, once I'm done with the upgrade, because the board still works just fine as it is. Uh, but immediately what you can see here is that there is one NAND populated and one NAND unpopulated. So, of course, you'll have a single 128 gigabyte NAND on this board, uh, because, of course, this is a 128 gigabyte configuration. Um, and you might think that you could simply upgrade this board by simply taking a new NAND and soldering it onto these pads and that would be it. Well, unfortunately, that will not work for two reasons. Uh, a, because the firmware on this NAND is telling the machine that there is only one NAND, so if you do add a second one, uh, it will not restore. Um, and B, if we go ahead and flip the board over here and take a look at the back of it here, you can see that there are a bunch of components in this area behind that second unpopulated NAND pads, a set of NAND pads there, that are not populated. And you can see there's quite a bit of them. Now, if I go ahead and take another board here, you can see this one already has two NANDs installed. Uh, but if we go ahead and take a look at the back side of this one, in that same spot, you can see that all those components that were missing on the other board are populated on this board. So there are, of course, a bunch of resistors and capacitors in this spot uh, right around here. There's one missing uh, right here, I believe. Uh, but there are quite a few more components in that area uh, that need to be populated in order for that second NAND chip to actually work. So go ahead and take a look at that again. And yeah, you can see how many components are not populated there. 
And actually, if we go ahead and take a look at the schematic, I'll show you how to identify those components and uh, get the correct values and stuff. So if you don't have a donor board like I do, uh, you can just buy those components brand new off like Mauser or something and install them onto these pads. So let me show you the schematic real quick and I will show you what to look for uh, to determine what components are needed. All right, so I've gotten the schematic open on my computer, as you can see here. And in order to determine the components you need to reinstall in order to get this second NAND to function, you need to search for this string right here, at least in the case of the double NAND or the two NAND boards like these, uh, it'll be named SSD underscore 2L. And I believe what that means is SSD underscore two landing pads, or maybe two layer. Uh, I don't know exactly, but I'm pretty sure it's two landing pads is what that means. Um, so as you can see, any component that has that SSD underscore 2L label is a component that's not going to be present on the board if this NAND isn't present on the board. Uh, so you can see some of the most compo most important components here are these four AC coupling capacitors here, these 0.22 microfarad capacitors. Um, and most of these components should show um, the footprint that they are. These, for some reason, don't. Uh, but this resistor does. You can see 0201. Uh, this capacitor here, 0201. Um, and then, of course, we've got a bunch of other components, like these two pull-down resistors here, also 0201s. Uh, we've got an inductor here. Uh, we've got uh, more capacitors here, a bunch more 0201s, 10402, you can see there. Um, and then one feed-through capacitor here, and some more uh, capacitors on that power rail, and more here. And as you can see, there is quite a few components, including these here, these pull-down resistors, or one pull-up resistor, one pull-down resistor, uh, that need to be present. Um, so it isn't an insignificant amount of work to reinstall all these components, uh, but of course we need to do so in order to allow that second NAND to function once we install it. So the first thing I'm going to do here before I install all these components is I'm going to remove the original NAND from the board. And the reason I'm going to do that is because removing that NAND, A, requires uh, not using the preheater due to how much pressure we have to remove to uh, to use to remove it due to the underfill that's used to secure it to the board. And B, we also have to heat the board up to uh, pretty high temperatures, about 380 to 400 degrees Celsius, and that could cause the components that we install using leaded solder uh, to melt and come off the board while we're working. So the first thing I want to do is remove the original NAND, and then from there we can begin the process of installing these missing components, as well as the two new NANDs that need to be installed. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and begin that process. All right, so as you can see here, I've got the board out on my workspace here. And in order to perform this uh, removal, you will need something like this. And this is an underfill removal tool. So we're on it right now. It's a two-ended, basically a little X-Acto knife handle is what it most closely resembles, I'd say. Um, but I've got two attachments on here right now. Um, on this end, I have a little hook attachment, as you can see. And what I'm going to use this for is I'm going to use it to scrape the underfill from around the perimeter of the chip. And of course we can't do it yet until the board is, uh, or this chip and board around it is pretty warm, uh, which will of course heat with the hot air. Um, but on this end, I've got sort of a small pointed tool, but not sharp on the end, just a sort of a round point, as you can see there. And what I'm gonna use this one for is once the chip is up to solder melting temperatures, I'm going to stick this underneath the chip to separate the underfill that's holding this chip to the board. It's basically gonna be glued to the board. Um, so it's not as simple as simply heating it, waiting till the solder is molten, and then just lifting it up with a pair of tweezers as I've done many times in the past. Um, because this has underfill, it requires a little bit of force to remove. So the first thing we need to do is get some weight on the board. So I've got this, uh, weight here. You can see it's a hacko thing, but of course it's designed to hold a board, but I'm just going to use it to press the board down against my workspace here so it doesn't move around on me because it does require a little bit of force to use this tool. Um, so the next thing we need to do is simply start heating um, and prepare to remove the underfill around the perimeter of this chip. So I'm going to turn my hot air on uh, to about uh, 300 to 350 degrees Celsius for right now, which is not going to be enough to melt the solder uh, with the board not on a preheater like this. Uh, so we'll go ahead and turn that on. 
turn the air pressure up a little bit to around 60% and then set the hot air to about 350 degrees. And with the hot air set to around 350, uh, you just want to use it to um, preheat the board in this area and mainly of course focus the, the heat onto the chip you're trying to remove. Um, so we're just going to let this heat up for a little bit. And also on this particular board, you want to remove this little piece here, otherwise it's going to melt on you. So let's get that off. And of course, we will put that back once we're done. I'm not sure it's really necessary, but I'll put it back. So we're just going to wait till we get a good amount of heat in this chip. And then once you think it's good and hot, you can start taking your little hook tool like this and just start scraping the underfill around from the edge of the chip. And if done correctly, you should see it start to flake off. Now do not press too hard with this tool or you will damage either the chip or remove solder mask from the board, which you don't want to do. Uh, so we'll just take that and separate the underfill like so. It does require a little bit of force, but don't use too much, like I said. So, now once the underfill is removed, I'm going to increase my hot air temperature to about 380 degrees Celsius. And yes, I do realize that's pretty hot, uh, but the reason I'm using that temperature is because we're not using a preheater. And I should also note we're not using flux on this, and I'll explain why in a minute, or I guess you'll see why in a minute, but basically, when you remove underfill like this, it basically turns into this little, this just basically flakes off. You can see a bunch of flakes of it already from removing it around the perimeter of the chip. And if you have flux on there, that actually makes the underfill all clump up and just make a big mess on the board, uh, which of course you don't want. Uh, so we're just gonna let this chip heat up here for a little bit. And then once we think it's hot enough, we're gonna start to push this tool underneath the chip. And you wanna kinda get an opening for it. So there, I've got an opening for it there. Now the chip is not fully up to melting temperature yet. And you've got to be very careful when you push this under there, because if you push it under with the solder not molten yet, you will rip pads, and of course, you can't really recover from that easily. So we're just going to make sure this is nice and warm. And this does take a little bit of time, so just take your time with it. You can periodically check. And if it feels hard to push your tool in there, like too hard, uh, definitely don't force it in there. Um, but when the chip is ready to come off, uh, when you push this under, I guess the best way to describe it would be like a knife through butter. Not a hot knife, but a cold knife through butter. <laughs> I guess is the best way to describe it. But uh, you don't want to put too much force, but it shouldn't require, it does require a little bit of force, just not a lot. So we'll continue to wait here. start trying to push it under and sometimes when you do this you'll start to see a little bit of solder pop out of the sides of the chip and if that happens that is a sure indication that the solder is beginning to melt under there uh, but that doesn't happen all the time And if you're having a little bit of trouble like I am right now, just increase your air temperature a little bit. So I'm going to go up to about 390 degrees now, just 10 degrees more. And you don't want to go too crazy with the heat, but you also don't want to not heat it enough. And that was enough. So you can see my tool's going in. It feels like butter. So make sure while your tool's under there that you fully heat the entire chip. And then as you do that, you can slowly and carefully start to lift up on it with your tool. Now don't force it. Just kind of do this. Eventually you'll see the chip start to move. And just like that, the chip is now removed. So go ahead and pick up the chip and place it somewhere away from the board 
And now I'm going to switch my tool on here to the flat tool and I'm going to use that to clean the residual solder and the residual underfill mainly off the pads of the board. So as you can see I've got that on here now and we're just going to use this to kind of scrape like this. Don't go too much of an angle but kind of keep it at a, a slight angle, a little bit less than 45 degrees and that way you don't gouge the board. Um, so I've still got my air at 380. I put it back down to 380. So we're going to heat the board up again. Two solder melting temperatures, of course. And you'll immediately know when it's solder melting temperatures because the tool will get caught on the solder balls otherwise. So you can see now it's not. So now you're just going to take this tool, lightly press against the board, and just scrape the underfill away. Now if we had flux on here at this stage, this stuff would all be turning into a big nasty clump uh, combined with the sticky flux. So not having flux on the board at this stage really helps a lot. You just want to go careful, carefully. Don't gouge the board because you will da either damage pads or damage the solder mask. All right, and that looks good there. You can see the underfill has been fully removed. Now, before I stop heating, I'm gonna first re remove the underfill off these capacitors right here, just in case this little glob of it gets in the way of this NAND. So I'm gonna reduce my temperature, as to not melt the solder and as to not uh, mess these capacitors up here. And I'm just gonna use my tool to clear away this solder or this underfill next to these capacitors. Why they put underfill on just some capacitors, I have no idea. All right, and that's about good there. So the next thing we need to do is use the soldering iron to remove all this residual solder and tin up the pads with some fresh leaded solder. So I'm gonna turn off my hot air. Um, you don't wanna let the board cool down too much, uh, but I'm gonna turn off the hot air, let that cool down, and then we will start uh, preparing these pads for new NANDs to be installed. Alright, so the hot air is cooled down now, so the first thing we need to do is just apply some flux to these pads. Just like so, and I'm also going to apply some to here because we need to remove uh, all of this solder. So with the flux applied, we're just going to take some fresh solder and apply it to the pads. All right, and now with our pads tanned with some fresh leaded solder, now we want to take our solder wick and just remove all of that solder. And the reason we're doing this is just so the pads are nicely tanned with leaded solder, uh, which will make installing the NANDs a little bit easier. All right, and now that that's done, the next thing we need to do is simply clean the pads with some rubbing alcohol and a paper towel. Um, and of course, that's just to remove all of the old flux. All right, and that looks good. The pads are nice and clean. So now the next thing we need to do is prepare to install the missing components on the underside of this NAND. Um, and of course, that will allow that second NAND to work when we install it. So with that, the first thing I'm going to do is get my donor board up here uh, to remove the components from it. Um, now you don't need a donor board for this. Um, the parts like I showed are all available or all listed with their values and footprints in the schematic. So you can simply use that to purchase those parts from any electronics distributor such as Mauser or what have you. So I'm going to use a donor board because I've got one right here um, that I'm not going to use for anything else. You can see I've already taken some parts of it off like that PMIC there. Um, so we're going to use it from there. Um, so I'll get everything mounted up. We'll start by removing the components from this board and then installing them to this board. All right, so as you can see here, I've gotten the donor board on my preheater here and I've gotten the other board right here next to it so I can uh, look at it and compare to it as I desolder these components. Now, I think the easiest way to do this is I'm just gonna take them all off at once even though I know that seems a bit strange because then I gotta keep track of all of them. Uh, but I think I can lay them out here on my table, and then 
I can keep them in the correct position and orientation, even though they are very small components. They are mostly O201s. And then I will take them and re-solder them onto the other board uh, after I'm done. So I'm going to go ahead and get everything warming up here, and I'll just start removing components. All right, so there's definitely no way I can keep track of all these components at once. So I'm gonna stop here, switch to the other board, start installing on the other board, and then just keep switching back and forth until I'm done. That way I'll do it in chunks of about 10 or 11 components each. There's about 40 components that have to be transferred. Um, and that should be, just, just take me four, four rotations here and I should be done. So let's get the other board on. I'll show you how to tin all the pads and then we'll begin reinstalling more components. All right, so I am gonna get the board uh, warmed up here with the preheater, and then we're just gonna tin all these pads uh, with my soldering iron to get some leaded solder onto them. Uh, that'll make it a whole lot easier to solder the components on, and then we can start soldering the components as we go. All right, so with uh, the flux applied, we're just gonna take the tip of my iron here, apply a little bit of solder to it, and then just go over all these pads. All right, so that's all the solder applied. So now we'll just take components and start installing. Okay, I think installing is going to be a little bit easier off of the board preheater, so that's what I'm going to do instead, because the preheater makes my hands get too hot. <laughs> All right. And that's all those components. So that's 10 of them, about, actually, I think about 12 components in total there. Uh, so now I just need to do that four more times with 10 more components each time, and I'll have it completely done. So I'm gonna do that off camera, get all the components installed, and we will go from there. All right, so as you can see there, I've gotten all the components reinstalled. You can see uh, right here is where the components are supposed to be. And as you can tell, everything is now installed, or you probably really can't tell, but I've gone through this. It's pretty hard to show here, uh, but I've gone all through this and checked over everything. Everything looks good. And uh, yeah, we should be all set to uh, install some NANDs onto this board. And in theory, uh, we should be all good to go. So let me get the camera back mounted up in the tripod and we'll begin the process of reballing the NANDs and preparing to install them onto this board. All right, so as you can see, I've got uh, my chips here ready to begin reballing. Uh, but before I do, I just wanted to uh, give you some information about these specific chips that I have right here. Now, you might be able to read uh, the part number right there. And these chips are KICM223. Uh, part number chips. So these are Keoxia uh, one terabyte chips. And when you buy these chips, you want to make sure, if at all possible, that they are brand new, unprogrammed blank chips. That will be your greatest pointer in the way of success, basically. So if you get these blank, unprogrammed, brand new, uh, you are likely to be able to just install these onto the board and have no problems whatsoever when restoring. However, these chips, they were blank and brand new, but I actually <laughs> did some sort of experiment on these, uh, which I'll probably get into in a future video. Uh, but for now, uh, I've done an experiment on these where the original uh, firmware was overwritten, or new firmware rather, was, was programmed onto them. So these are no longer blank chips. Now the reason I'm using chips that aren't blank in this instance is because I want to show you what happens uh, when you t attempt to do that and how to rectify that, which is actually a pretty recent development here. 
Um, so if you recall in a previous video I made, uh, I installed some non-blank chips onto Luke Miani's uh, Mac Mini when we did that upgrade, and they did not work. Now, to solve that, I replaced those NANDs with some new NANDs that I bought that were blank. And in fact, one of those actually ended up being dead, uh, which is another thing I'll get into. But I've done this upgrade many times since then. I've never gotten another dead NAND, so I think the likelihood of that happening again is second to none, really. Uh, so anyway, with that, uh, I'm going to begin reballing these chips, and uh, then we'll install them onto the board. I expect it not to work, uh, but I will show you how to rectify it if it doesn't work uh, using a special programmer. So with that, I'm going to begin reballing. So to perform the reball here, uh, I'm just going to use some solder paste with this stencil right here. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is just take one of these NANDs, and notice it does already have some solder on it. Uh, I actually put this on here when I initially did that experiment that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but the balls are still a little bit small uh, to use with basically untinned pads. So we are going to apply uh, some extra solder to this chip uh, by way of some solder paste with this stencil, uh, just to make the solder balls the correct size to accurately and properly solder to the board. So, the first thing we need to do is just tape the chip to the back of the stencil in the correct alignment. So let me do that real quick here. And to do that, I'm just going to use some Kapton tape. So I've got the NAND on some Kapton tape here. And we'll just take it. Align it to the holes in the stencil. And tape it down. So from here, we're just going to take some solder paste and apply a little bit of it to the footprint here on the stencil. So that's probably enough right there. And then we'll take this tool, which I've actually put on the end of my underfill tool, as you can see here, and just use it to push the solder paste equally into all the holes. Now, as I mentioned, this already has a lot of solder on it, so it won't, there won't be much solder paste that goes into these holes, uh, but there should be a little bit. And uh, that's all we really need in this case. All right, so once the solder paste is in all the holes, we just need to turn on the hot air to about 300 degrees Celsius. And then with that, we'll take a pair of curved tweezers like this and press the stencil tightly against the chip. Uh, if you don't do that, uh, there's a chance that the solder paste will run underneath the stencil and make some of the solder balls larger than others, which of course you don't want. So once you've done that, you just take uh, the uh, hot air here and just heat the stencil until all their solder paste melts into the holes. All right, so as you can see there, all the solder paste is fully melted onto their pads there. So now we'll just take the chip off the bottom of the stencil. just like so. And then once uh, the uh, chip is off the stencil, we're going to apply a little bit more flux to it. Just like so. And then we're just going to heat it one more time with the hot air off the stencil. And that will make sure all these solder balls are molten as expected. Okay, and that all looks good. Uh, you can see the solder balls look really nice on there. Uh, they're nice and even, um, and there's no balls that are, are taller than others or bigger than others. Um, so one thing you want to check for when you do this, um, you want to make very care be very careful of this, is sometimes when you reball a solder paste, there's a tiny little, or tiny little pieces of solder um, that get just little tiny solder balls that just get all over the place. Um, if you see those, which I do see some, you want to fully clean this with uh, rubbing alcohol and a paper towel. Uh, get all the flux off of there, and that will uh, remove all of those uh, little pieces of solder as well. Um, so I'm going to do that real quick, and uh, then the NANDs will be ready to install onto the board. Alright, so as you can see there, I have wiped all of the flux off of the chip here and uh, everything looks good. So now I'll just do the same process to the second NAND, and then we'll be ready to install both of them onto the board.
All right, so as you can see here, I've got the board up in the preheater now. Uh, you can see uh, we've got the NAND pads here. So uh, all we need to do now is simply apply some flux to these pads, uh, place and align the chips, and then just solder them on. So we'll go ahead and start doing that now. Now because there's no flux on the chips, we do want a good amount of flux on the pads themselves. And once you've got the uh, flux on the pads there, uh, we can simply take our chips and solder them onto the board, or at least align them to the board and then solder them. Uh, so we'll just take one here, and pin one on the MacBook Air is right here. Of course, you want to verify that based on either how the originals came off or, of course, using the schematic for the board. So you want to try to get them aligned as close as possible. Of course, you don't need to get them perfect, uh, but you do want them pretty good. And of course, you can always compare to another board if you're not sure if you've got one. Uh, but everything there looks good, so I'm going to turn on the hot air uh, to about 300 to 330 degrees Celsius this time, uh, because we have the preheater and we've got lead, leaded solder on there. Uh, so I've got the hot air warming up now, and once it warms up, we'll just simply start heating the chips um, until they're soldered onto the board. So you can see that one there is already soldered fully. And I'm sure you can see that one move into position as well. And just like that, that's both chips fully installed. And now we're ready to partially reassemble the system and attempt to restore it in DFU mode. So I'm gonna get everything hooked up and prepared for the DFU restore and then we'll test it and uh, see what happens. All right, so you can see here, I've got my restore setup going here. Um, basically, this is just an iMac G4 that I modified and uh, connected a Mac Mini M1 to it, as you can see, I've got right there. Um, so, but it's not complete, of course. It's just, you know, it's just the best machine I have for this right now. So that's what I'm gonna use. Um, and over here, I've got the MacBook Air itself uh, sitting folded and uh, with the motherboard out uh, towards the towards us here. And the reason I've done that is because getting this machine into DFU mode with the key commands uh, when it's in this state with new NANDs on it like this is extremely difficult. So I'm gonna show you a much easier way to get it in DFU mode um, that doesn't involve using the key commands and works a whole lot better most of the time. So let me uh, get that prepared here, and I'll show you exactly how we're going to get this machine into DFU mode. All right, so before I start here, I want to show you exactly what will happen uh, when you try to power this machine on with new NANDs installed. So I'm just going to plug in USB-C power here. And as you can see, it just boot loops over and over and over again. You can see the ammeter is turning on and off like that. Uh, that means the device is boot looping, and because of that, it makes it very hard to get in DFU mode with the key commands. Now, I'm going to show you how to get into DFU mode a different way, and that is by using these jumpers over here. So if you take note here, you can see these jumpers right, let's see if I can show it a little better. right in the middle of the screen there, you can see some jumpers um, and those are actually where buttons would normally go. They're located right here, as you can see. Um, and specifically, this one is the DFU button right there. However, there is a resistor in line with that button, at least one of the pads of that button. You might be able to make those pads out right here. So basically, what you have to do, at least on this M1 MacBook Air, is before you power it on, you have to short the top pad of this resistor, or I guess the bottom looking at it this way, to the pad of this button right there. And I'm going to use a pair of tweezers to do that here. And basically you hold the tweezers on, plug in the power, and then keep holding until you see DFU mode appear on the host Mac. So that's exactly what I'm going to do right now. Okay, and that was successful. The machine is now in DFU mode. So I'm gonna switch back over to the 
uh, iMac here, or the Mac Mini, whatever you want to call it, and we'll begin the process of attempting to restore Mac OS onto the device. All right, so you can see there that the uh, MacBook is connected into DFU mode here. Uh, so we're just going to simply attempt to restore it and see what happens. So I am restoring it to the latest version of Mac OS Sonoma that exists at the time of making this video. And we'll just keep an eye on both machines here. Okay, you can see the screen is on on the MacBook Air. That's a good sign. Now, like I said, I don't expect this to work, but we'll see. I just want to show you what you can do if it does not work. All right, so while it doesn't see that the restore has actually failed yet, it does indeed appear that the restore is has failed. Um, if you can make out that ammeter there, it's in that boot loop state once again, uh, which means it's trying to boot, uh, but it can't because the NANs don't have the software on it that it's expecting. Um, so, that means that we need to reprogram the NANs accordingly. Now, now, as I mentioned, these were blank NANs that I experimented with on, or that I experimented with in the past, um, so that's why um, they are not working anymore because they've been programmed with something else. And there we go, I just got an error on the screen there. You can see right there that we got an error 9. So that means it was disconnected in restore mode when it wasn't expecting it to be disconnected and the restore cannot be completed. So I'm going to get the MacBook Air board back out. We're going to desolder the NANs once again and then I will show you exactly what needs to be done with those NANs in order to make them work once again. Alright, so as you can see here, I've gotten the NANs desoldered from the device once again. Um, and uh, in order to proceed with these next steps, you're going to need a special tool. And uh, that tool is right here. Um, this is called the JCP13 Programmer. Um, there's actually a new version of this out now called the JCP15 which supports both BGA 110 and BGA 315 NANs uh, used on some M2 models and M3 models. Uh, but this one is only a BGA 110 model, as you can see right there. Um, so it will work with the NANs we're using in this instance, but it will not work with the NANs uh, from some of the later systems. So let me get this hooked up to the computer, and I'll show you exactly what needs to be done. Actually, before I do that, uh, you want to get your NANs out here and you want to label them. And the reason for this is because we're programming them, they will need to be uh, installed into specific spots on the board. Now at this point, it doesn't matter which NANs are which because they're unprogrammed. Uh, but you want to take a marker or something and just label one of them zero, like that, and the other one one. So we've got zero and one just there. Um, of course, like I said, this is only for machines that have two NANs only, not the ones that have eight, like the M1 Pro Max Ultra and M2 Pro Max and Ultra and all that stuff. This is only for the standard M1, standard M2, and maybe the standard M3. Uh, I forget exactly how that's configured. Uh, but basically, any of them with only two NANs, this applies to. And this also only applies to KICM223 NANs, because the files I have on hand... Uh, the only files I have on hand to program to these are only for KICM223 NANs. So with that out of the way, I'm going to switch over to the computer and I'll show you the process of programming these NANs to be used on the MacBook Air or any other system. Alright, so as you can see here, I've got the JC programming software open. So the first thing you want to do is take your programmer like this and simply plug it into the computer. And as you can see, its little OLED panel comes on. Now over on the computer side, you need to go up here to port and make sure P13 is selected. Uh, it will show any other serial ports your system might have. And once it's selected, select connect. You'll hear it beep, and now the programmer is ready to accept a NAND. So, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put in NAND number 0 that we just labeled. So yeah, first we're going to take NAND number 0, align pin 1 to this lower corner where you see 
a little dot on the socket here. And just place it into the programmer. You can see it detects the KICM223 NAND installed right there. And it just loaded it into the software. So, in the software here, the first thing you're going to want to do is select Mac, and you can select any model, it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to select MacBook Pro. Um, and now we need to write a dump onto this NAND. Now, before I select this dump, I want to give a huge thanks to the person who provided me with these NAND dumps, and that is Giles uh, of Polysoft Services in France. And in fact, if you are, live in France and you want this upgrade done to your system, uh, he does perform these services. Um, and if you're in the U.S., I will perform these services as well. So if you want these upgrades done to your machine, uh, you can let me know if you're in the U.S. or you can contact Giles at Polysoft Services in France if you live in France or even anywhere else in Europe, really. So with that out of the way, uh, let's write Giles Dump onto this NAND. So since we put NAND0 in, the first thing we need to do is go up here and locate the dumps of the NAND. So you can see I've got these two right here. Um, so UN000 is NAND0 and UN100 is NAND1. And if you're confused about which is which, you can see they're labeled as such on the schematic. So you can see this one, the one that's uh, vertical here is UN00. The one that's horizontal is UN100. And a good rule of thumb, if you don't have schematics, well, actually, it seems to be an exception in this case, but usually NAND0 is closest to the SOC, um, and NAND1 is furthest away, but as you can see, this is an exception. So it does help to have schematics, but of course, you can guess and just reprogram again. It's no big deal. So let's go back over to the software. We're going to select UN00. And the software will simply write that file onto the NAND. And you can see there it reports NAND repair completed. So now we'll just take the NAND out of the programmer. And we'll take NAND number one, the one we labeled number one, and put that in the programmer. Wait for it to load it up here. And then you just simply, sim simply select Write Data again. Go back to that same path here. And this time we'll select NAND1, the dump for NAND1 for the KICM223. And as you can see there, the NAND repair was completed. Now, I did mention that I do have a bad NAND, and I figure you might want to see what that does when we try to program it. So I've got the NAND right here. I've actually labeled it with a little X on it, so I know it's bad. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in the programmer. Now, at this point, it all seems fine. So we'll try to write one of the dumps to it. And as you can see there, it reports NAND repair failed. Now I've tried flashing many things onto this NAND. Uh, nothing works. And this NAND has never worked since I even got it when it was sold to me as a program set for the M1 Mac Mini that I initially tried it with. So that NAND is dead and that's why that didn't work initially when I tried it in that first video. So now that we've gotten both NANDs programmed, we simply need to solder them onto the board now in the correct positions. Again, NAND0 goes here, NAND1 goes here, and then we'll be ready to test restoring the device one more time. All right, so as you can see there, I've got the NAND soldered back onto the board. Uh, I've got the machine already booted into DFU mode, so let's attempt to restore it and see what happens.
Okay, we've got video on the MacBook Air once again. And look at that. As you can see, we've got a progress bar, and the progress bar is indeed moving. So at this point, you can be pretty much certain that the NANs are now fine, and the machine is happy with them. Uh, the OS is now being restored onto the NANs. Um, that A indicates that all my soldering with all those tiny components was good, and B, that the NAND programming went successfully as expected. So we'll just sit here, wait for this to finish, and check out the final results. All right, the restore was just completed successfully. Uh, the machine is rebooting now, so let's see what happens. And look at that, it is booting up. And just like that, it's done. So now, uh, I'm going to get this thing shut down, uh, because it doesn't have a heat sink on it yet, so it's going to run a little bit hot. Um, and then get everything cleaned up, get the heat sink on, and then set it up and see what everything looks like. All right, as you can see here, I've gotten the device mostly reassembled. Uh, you can see I've gotten all the flux cleaned up everywhere. Uh, I've got the heat sink reinstalled. I didn't install any of the covers for the connectors yet, uh, but I'll do that in a little bit. Uh, so let's go ahead and power it on and take a look at the system specs. All right, so you can see we're at the login screen here. Let's go ahead and log in. And there is the system. So let's go ahead into about this Mac. You can see it's all the same specs there. Same 8 gigs of RAM base model, of course. Uh, let's go ahead and open up Disk Utility. And there it is, two terabytes of internal storage. So that has been the successful upgrade of this M1 MacBook Air from a single NAND with only 128 gigs of storage to dual NANDs with two terabytes of storage. Now, one thing I want to note uh, before I end this video is according to Giles, uh, the guy who sent me that firmware or those dumps, uh, that I programmed onto the NANDs on this machine, he says that um, it's possible that the either the read speed or the write speed is a little bit slower than you would expect uh, when you do that. Uh, I'm not really sure why. I've never really tested that myself. Uh, but what he says uh, rectifies that is simply DDing a bunch of zeros to the entire disk, so all two terabytes uh, of zeros, which seems kind of weird to me. Uh, I might try that. I'm not going to try it in this video, uh, but I just wanted to give you uh, that little piece of information just in case you experience uh, some weird oddities with the speeds of the drive, which I've done this once before with these uh, with these uh, firmware dumps, and I've never really experienced any noticeable issues, so it may or may not happen. I'm not exactly sure. But anyway, with all that done, that has been the successful upgrade of this M1 Apple MacBook Air to two terabytes of internal storage and the demonstration of the process through the entire way. So with that, I hope you enjoyed this video.